Welcome back to another episode of the Sky Society podcast. Today I have on Lindsay Park. She is the Senior Marketing Manager at Walmart. Welcome, Lindsay. Thanks, Natalie. Glad to be here. So happy to have you. We have so much to go through with your experience freelancing and how you ended up transitioning into your role now at Walmart. But before we dive into all of that, can you share a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, so uh, I'm Lindsay Park, like you said, and I'm senior marketing manager at Walmart on the social media team. And yeah, I work on actually our local social programs. So I help manage our stores, 4,700 Facebook, Instagram accounts. You help manage 4,700 Facebook and Instagram accounts? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is insane. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, wow. I had no idea. So Walmart has local accounts for every single one of their stores? Every single one. Walmart is super unique in how we approach our micro marketing strategy. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, we're going to have to talk a little bit about that too, but <laughs> we're going to make our way over to Walmart. So you started off your career after graduating. You did a little bit of like social media work here and there for other companies before transitioning into doing freelance work. What made you decide to do freelance social media instead of just doing social media coordinator or manager roles? Yeah. So actually I was in college. Um, I was very determined that I was going to be a lawyer. I was very aggressive about it. That, that was my destiny. Ever since I was a little girl, I said, I'm going to be a lawyer someday. And that's my destiny in life. So I was pre-law. I was in school. I was a barista uh, part-time to get through school. And our coffee shop that I was working at said, hey, we need a social media manager. And it's an extra 300 bucks a month. And I was like, heck yes, I want that extra 300 bucks yes. a month. <laughs> I'm in college and I am broke. So I was like, yeah, I was like, I've been managing my own social media. Sure, I can do it. So yeah, I started managing social media for the coffee shop in my college town. And I started doing, I was like, man, I really love this. And I was telling my husband, I got married super young in, in college. And I was telling my husband, I was like, I really think that I could maybe make a job out of this if I went to all of the small businesses in our college town and I offered to do their social media for a few hundred bucks like a month. Uh, what I didn't know that I was making is that I was making a freelance business. I was making a social media <laughs> business. To me, I was just collecting paychecks every month for just doing social media. Like it didn't, it didn't connect with me that I was building a business. I was just like trying to uh, make more money while I was in college. So. I told my husband, I was like, I really need a camera. And actually I came home one day from class and he had bought a camera and it was sitting on our coffee Aww. table. <laughs> yeah. He, yeah. It was kind of a turning point. I was like, okay, I can do this. I've got some support. Like I'm going to do this. And so I started going around to small businesses in our town and started saying, Hey, you know, this is what I've done for the shop. I work work at this is what I could do for you um this is what I offer I made like little packages and yeah I just went around and sold myself to basically everyone all over town and it went really well at first I had no idea what I was doing uh I made obviously some mistakes early on and but I got about three or four really solid clients that were like a really trustworthy uh, paycheck every month so I just built off of that I really focused a lot of energy there and then I went into a marketing class at college just as an extra class. I was like, you know, I really should see what, you know, they're teaching in marketing because I was a poli sci major. And I was like, I, since I'm doing this as a side hustle while I'm in school, I just should go get some tips. So I went to this marketing class and uh, a few weeks in the semester, I kept missing class for meetings and with my clients <laughs> and my marketing professor called me in one day and he was like, why do you keep missing class? And I told him what I was doing. He looked me dead in the eyes and he said, you should drop out of school. Oh, what? <laughs> he said, you oh should gosh. drop out of school. Yeah. And, That's amazing. Uh, Did you? Yeah. Uh, no, but I switched to online college so or online classes to kind of finish out my degree, uh, which I actually only recently finished my degree. But yeah. That is an insane story. Let me ask you. So while you were in class, this marketing class, and then you were also doing your own social media work, did you feel like what you were doing in the real world was just so much more valuable, like comparatively to what you were learning in class? Yes, a hundred percent. And that's exactly what that marketing professor told me. He looked me down in the eyes. He said, you should drop out. And I said, why? And he said, because I can't teach you what you're learning right now. And that is so true. Um, we really, I think as a society, you can kind of see the shift when you read a job description now in marketing. Almost always it will say for your degree, 
or equivalent experience because we're starting to understand the value of experience and how much more you can discern the right answer over when you have the hands-on experience as opposed to having the same degree everybody else has, which that's, that's harsh. And I'm not trying to be harsh towards college degrees because I, I went back and I got mine. I have lots of like everyone I work with has a degree, but I think that hands-on experience gives you such an edge to grow so much faster. I could not agree with you more. And it's so funny that you say that because Similarly to you, I didn't do freelance, but I was able to, I got my full-time job marketing before I graduated. I basically just told them, I was like, yeah, I'm basically done. But like, I, I really wasn't. So I was working, I'd go into work every day from like seven to three. And then I would drive to campus and take classes from like four to 10. And I would be in my classes and being like, what I like, this is not all what I need to be successful at my job. Like there's just a huge gap between what I'm learning and what I need to be successful. And that's actually why I built Sky Society. So that's why any of this exists today. Like that's why I built the accelerator because I saw that firsthand of like, there's just, you can't replace experience, can't be taught in school. I even like went around, I did a bunch of internships in college and I would, and you can only like get credit for one internship per department. So I went to different departments and was like, Hey, can you create a class for me so I can get credit for internship? And I got three (laughs) departments to create classes for me so I could take internships for credit. And yeah, I just, I love that you say that because I'm fully on board with that, that the best way to learn is by getting experience. A hundred percent. And that gap you're talking about between what you're learning and then what you need to actually be successful, that gap is hands-on and it's also mentorship leadership. Yes. which is what's so amazing about this podcast, because yet there is a massive gap. I, I think specifically for women, of course, especially young women in business, there is a huge mentorship leadership gap um, that exists for us that we, I think, can fill with podcasts, but also with someone who is kind of in our corner that we can ask the really dumb questions to. They're not dumb, but in our brains, I think as women, we tend to think, this is a dumb question. Am I going to be judged if I ask this question? But I really need to know this, but how do I find out without people judging me? And so I think having a person in your corner that you can say just whatever you want to, that is that gap you're talking about that you need to be successful. And I think this podcast can really, really bring that for people. I hope so. Yeah, that's absolutely the goal. I felt that way at my job, just not like, who am I supposed to ask these questions to, right? Like my family doesn't understand, like nobody, none of my friends are doing what I'm doing and it can feel really isolating. So um, yeah, I love that you said that one, one thing I want to ask you. And one thing I, that you did that was really brave is that you went and pitched yourself knowing that you didn't know everything. Like you're going to different companies saying I can do your social media, but I'm sure in the back of your head, you're like, I am absolutely figuring this out as I go. And I think that fear of not having it fully figured out is what holds a lot of women back from like going and doing freelancing work. A lot of people talk like I want to do it, but because they don't have it all figured out and they haven't done it yet, they kind of want to wait till everything is like perfectly ready before they launch. So can you maybe talk through or or how someone who's like maybe afraid to get started can kind of push through that fear. Yeah. Um, first of all, the more you do something, the more that you get comfortable with it. And I, <laughs> I started doing that when the concept of imposter syndrome was still pretty like new. It wasn't talked about a ton. I remember you having this feeling of, I am just such a liar every time I would go in. (laughs) And uh, I even got to the point where I started lying about, I did end up lying about my age when I went to meetings because I, very early on people, these business owners would ask me, they'd say, how old are you? Like, I'm 19. And they'd be like, yeah, you know, I liked your pitch, but I just feel like you're too young. And they wouldn't want to trust their business to a 19 year old, even though I felt, I knew that I could make their business successful. I knew I can make their accounts successful. They were just seeing a huge age age sign. Yeah. Yeah. So I started lying to people and say, oh yeah, I'm like 26. And they believe me. And so (laughs) I just let them, or I would let people say something. I would say like, how old do you think I am? And they'd be like, I don't know, like 25. And I'm like, yes, that is how old I am. (laughs) You're right. So I, I did a little bit of lying and yeah, I came to this point where I was like, I am, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm totally making this up as I go. And am I actually bringing value to these people? And I think that I had this moment where it kind of clicked for me. And 
I, I had this moment that clicked for me and I was like, oh, this is, this is why guys apply for jobs that they are only 40% qualified for and women apply for jobs that they are 90% qualified for. Uh, because I just had this moment where I was like, I am a professional the day that I decide that I am. And perception is everything. So when I walk into a room, how you perceive me is the most important valuable in that room. So if you look at me and you see an age, then that's just how valuable you're going to see me. If you look at me and you see somebody who's young and I see, and I've seen myself as just, I'm young. I don't bring a lot to the table. That's how you're going to see me too. But if I walk in the room and I'm like, no, I'm smart. I do my research. I bring a lot to the table. It doesn't matter how young I am. It doesn't matter how long I've been doing this because what I'm going to give you is valuable. When you come in with that air of confidence and that's the way, how you approach the table, that's how people view you. And once I kind of learned that superpower that how I viewed myself, others viewed me, it changed everything. I mean, it, it legitimately changed everything because then I was like, I don't want people to see me as inexperienced or young. I don't want people to just look at me. I want people to see the value. And so I had to see it in myself. And that sounds super cheesy, but it's, it's literally just blocking out in your brain, all these other things and convincing yourself, I am valuable. I bring value and I'm going to do that for this business. That's beautiful. And I can, I feel like you're hitting on personal things that touch points for me, me too, because I've always felt the same way of that. People looked at me when I was young in my career and like, wouldn't give me opportunities because of my age. Even the fact that that's a question that you're being asked, right? When you're saying, Hey, I had this business, I'm demonstrating this worth. And the fact that your age is a qualifying question for them in their mind is just unfortunate and unfortunate truth that that's like something that they they place a lot of value on, or they get asked that, or I've had people say like, Oh, you remind me of my, my daughter or something when I'm oh. doing something professional and you, you feel that one. <laughs> oh, I actually, so, um, when I first started working for Walmart, we were at, uh, we went to New York and we we're having this meeting about a new, new strategy for something. And, uh, we had some agency partners at the table with us. And they had not met me. They just met me. It was, it was brand new to this agency partner. I was brand new to Walmart. And one of my coworkers accidentally said, oh yeah, that year was the year that Lindsay graduated. And somebody from the agency said, oh, from getting your master's. And I was like, no. And they were like, oh, from getting your bachelor's. And I was like, no. And they were like, that's the year you graduated high school. And I was like, yeah. And I remember feeling so small in that moment, but I was like, maybe, maybe everyone will just see the value. We're in this huge room, you know, with lots of people, lots of agencies. I was like, maybe everyone will just see the value I bring and they ignore that because it got so quiet. A little bit later, we're talking about a strategy and I bring up something, a tactic we could do. And our leadership says, that's a fantastic idea. We should do that. And a man from the agency, the same man who was shocked by the year I graduated, he said, oh yeah, sure. Do whatever the teenager says. And <laughs> I, no way. I didn't know what to say in that moment. And, and people in the room from the agencies laughed. No one from Walmart laughed because everyone realized just how like disrespectful that was, but there were people from the agency who laughed. And I think maybe they didn't, they didn't understand how degrading that was. They just thought, oh yeah. And uh, yeah, that, and in that moment, I, I remember thinking to myself, like, I will never tell someone how old I am again. Um, but then I learned later on, as I got on in my career, that people who matter don't care. They really don't. And I'm not saying you will never not have to hide your age because I do anyway. It's a privacy issue. And just so you know, everyone, all your listeners know, legally, someone cannot, that's ageism. Legally, somebody cannot ask you how old you are um, and they can't uh, make jokes like that because it's discrimination in the workplace. So uh, if that ever does happen to you, just know that like you should absolutely say something. Wow. And something an was insane. something was done. Okay. That is still an insane story. And I feel like when we do think of ageism, we always think of it, you know, it is a big issue on the opposite end of people being discriminated against when they're older. But I feel like there's this, there's this part when you're really young and especially if you're really driven and ambitious and you get ahead that your age is such a limiting factor. When I was at the job I did before I quit to do Sky Society full-time, I was constantly told that whenever I would ask for more, I'd be told, 
you should be happy where you are. Like when I was your age, I was doing this. And I'm like, well, what does it matter with what you were doing when you, when you, I was your age, right? Like I'm my own person on my own path. And I hate it. I absolutely, I hated it. It was a huge reason why I ended up quitting and, and doing what I do now. I was so shocked by, I think the biggest learning curve for me over the past three years has, I was so shocked when I first started, how many people were not happy for me? How many people, not only where I worked or around me, and I, I'm a pretty open person, I'm a sharer. So I, sh- I, I shared a lot early on about my career journey and where I was at. And people were just, people were angry for me, angry at me, like how my journey was, how successful I was at such a young age. Like there were people who were happy for me and who accepted me. And I have to actually specifically call out, um, because I don't think this happens enough in the workplace, but there was a, I had a coworker when I first joined here and uh, she absolutely took me under her wing and she taught me pretty much everything I know and really helped me be successful, even though she was this, she, she's a black woman who has a, an MBA from a prestigious university, and she had to deal with sexism and racism every day um, to get where she was. And then uh, Walmart, not at Walmart, Walmart is an incredibly accepting culture, um, but to get to this point, she had to go through so much. And then I kind of walked in and what people would think was not qualified, what people would think was a very non-traditional path and people were angry at me and she was not she was extremely accepting of me uh she really kind of showed me the ropes around corporate and she's one of the people who really makes walmart such an incredible place that it is so uh yeah i have to actually credit the people who were around me with my success over the past three years Yeah. And you're absolutely right. There are people that will be champions for you. And then there are some that will, yeah, that'll compare you to their self or I don't, I don't know if it's jealousy. I don't know, you know, every, you know, what it is for each person, but, um, but yeah, the age piece is a hard one to have to navigate, especially when you're new. And I'm glad we're talking about this because a lot of our audience is really young and kind of having to navigate. I've even had girls be like, do I take off my graduation year? Like, do I hide that? So they don't know how young I am. Um, I know I did that I did. on my LinkedIn. You did? Yeah. Yeah. I did for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. I and st- it, yeah. I think I still do. I think I still did. <laughs> let them guess. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's super difficult to navigate that because, and I do, and you know, when I was young and I, I, I think now looking back, I could see, okay, I was naive in certain places and experience is valuable. And there's stuff that you like, we're even talking about the beginning, the stuff that you just, you got to learn with time. But also there's stuff that if you started early, like you did, or like I did, we have that extra experience under our belt that allows us to accelerate our careers at a younger age. And instead of being like penalized for it, because again, you were 19 or because you're a certain age, I think that there's a lot of work that needs to happen to, to hopefully have more people be celebrated for being really far in their career when they're young. Yeah. I think that we need to, I I think when you're young in your career, and that's, this is something I've also learned is that it is a balance between not letting anybody shut down your ideas or shut down what you bring to the table because of how old you are, but then also definitely tapping into the people who have been in this, like in this market for a very long time in this field and tapping into them and saying, like, seeing like, what do you know? Like how long, like, how long have you been doing this? Like, what was it like 10 years ago? And like really gleaning information from people who have been and in showing some respect for that, of course. Um, like, uh, sorry, mom brain is so real, but mm-hmm. like, for instance, knowledge is, is power. And I sat next to someone when I first started and he had been working at Walmart and in marketing for like 20 years. And I learned so much just from sitting next to somebody and just asking questions. And he was very happy to answer them. And then my director, my, uh, di- sorry, my sorry, my phone died for a second. Uh, So my director, my boss, he actually has been in the business for 15 years. And I have learned so much from him, so much wisdom, because when I first came in, I think this is true of a lot of people young in their career. I was very aggressive to show what I was capable of. I was a loose cannon, to be honest. Like I would pretty much say whatever I wanted to say. I pretty much do whatever I wanted to do. And my director was the person who would come in and be like, be a coach and be like, Hey, I see that you 
you want to get out there. And he would, while not discouraging my confidence and not discouraging me to get out there, he'd be like, hey, you know, 10 years ago, I was you. And this was a consequence of something that happened to me. So here's something you can take from that. I think finding those people who have been in it for a long time is so crucial to people who are younger uh, because you need someone to reel you back in a little bit and say, hey, you can be ambitious and you can put it out there, but here's maybe a more appropriate way to do it. So like I said, I would just say kind of whatever I wanted. And that actually doesn't get you far in corporate, just say whatever you want. So uh, be respectful of people's space and time. I think that was something that older uh, people in this career longer taught me. So I think being young is like, it's a balance. Don't let people yes. put you down or deter your confidence, but also respect and glean knowledge from people who have been in it for a long time, which is part of what I love about Walmart is that there are so many people here who showed me that respect and they really honed my confidence and honed that ambition, but they have like really been mentors to me. And so I think finding a company that you can get both from, that's how you grow at such a young age in your career. Yeah. And I think that's super key. It's that balance between confidence and arrogance and, and also just that, I think just that consistent willingness to learn takes you a lot of just accepting like, okay, I know, I, I know my worth. I know I'm young, but I'm, I'm capable and I deserve to be here. And also I know that there's so much I still have to learn and I'm open to all of that. And I don't go in thinking that I know everything. Yes. Yes. That's so true. Okay. Let's transition into what we're kind of been talking about is your career at Walmart. One of the pieces I would love to just hear a little more on is how you took that incredible freelance experience and like, or how did you like put that in your application or your resume, or how did you use that to get your job at Walmart? Cause I know some of the, sometimes I hear from girls and they feel like they can't get the job at the corporate company because they don't have the corporate experience. Okay. So I'll tell a quick story and then I'll give you some like one, two, three, some bullet points Perfect. that I think is, is helpful. So quick story. When I moved to Northwest Arkansas with my freelance business, I decided that I was done freelancing. I decided I was like, I want to hang it up. I hate doing the taxes. I want some health insurance. You know, I, I was ready to settle down, so to speak. So I started applying to pretty much everything. Uh, that is probably one of the best pieces of advice I can give anyone is to apply for everything, 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 everything. Because let's say even if you get an interview and you don't necessarily, you're like reading the job and you're not sure if you're going to love it. Maybe you get in the interview and you realize, oh, no, I actually do love this. They seem like a great team, a great company. So even if you're just kind of mildly interested, I highly recommend you apply. Um, because also every time, even if you don't get it, or even if you get into the interview and you're like, oh, no, I don't like this company. I don't like this team. Every time you get to interview, you're getting to hone and practice your elevator pitch. You're getting to hone your marketing skills of yourself. So every time you interview, like interview as much as possible. And that's the other thing is like, it, it's so intimidating, just like launching your business or, or applying for a job or interviewing for a job. It's so intimidating, but the more and more you do it, the better your elevator pitch gets, the more you start to remember and think about the things that you do that benefits the job. And you just, you become a better marketer, honestly, when you get good at marketing yourself. So apply for everything. So I was applying for everything. And I seriously interviewed for three jobs and two were at different agencies. And then this other uh, was for Walmart. And when I got to the interview and I realized it was for Walmart and it was for their social media team, I left the interview and I called my husband. I was like, there's no way I'm getting that job. There's no <laughs> way they're going to hire me. But I told him, I was like, that it's so cool that I got to interview, uh, but I just don't think there's no way I'm going to get that, that job. So these other two agencies um, that I interviewed for, it got pretty serious. I mean, it got down to like, this would be your salary. I had one of the agencies that was like, we're definitely going to hire you. We got to get our paperwork together. And on Saturday, I got an email and this was in June of 2019. Saturday, I got an email from the first agency. Hey, uh, we've actually decided to go a different direction. Uh, we're not going to hire you after all. Super bummed. No. But I was like, <laughs> super bummed. But I was like, okay, I got, <sighs> I got another one in my back pocket. Sunday, I got a call from the owner of that agency who had been like, we're definitely going to hire you. And she was like, hey, turns out we actually don't have the funding to hire you. So uh, uh, we're, we're actually going to scale back. And I was like, oh no. And I was bawling. And I told my husband, I was like, I was like, what am I going to, I was like, what am I going to do? I've applied for like a hundred jobs. And he was like, well, there's still the Walmart job. I was like, there's no way I'm getting the Walmart job. <laughs> and then 
Monday morning, I sure enough, I mean, this was literally a three day story. Monday morning, I got a phone call from the hiring manager. He said, Hey, we want to offer you a job. And I just, I broke down in tears, which I don't know how professional that is. On the call while he's, while he's telling you. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. I broke down because I was like, I'm never going to get this job. It's never, it's just not in the cards for me. And it sure enough was. And I realized I have been telling myself that I wasn't qualified or that I couldn't bring value. I've been telling myself no. And I almost lost out on the opportunity of a lifetime, literally something that changed my entire life because I was scared. Um, so yeah, apply for everything, literally everything, because you never know. Um, and I think that taught me the value of that. If you get turned down, you didn't want that job anyway. I'm going to tell you right now, because they didn't see the value in you. If you have to fight super hard to get into a role, you don't want that job because they don't see the value in you. They're going to expect a lot from you with no input. They're going to be watching you to see, can you really do it? You don't want that job. You want someone to hire you who is confident and who's going to help grow you. And that's what I got in my director. What an absolutely insane story. And also one that I think hopefully gives people a lot of hope. And I like what you said, that self-limiting belief, right? It's like, I'm not qualified. Well, why, why are you not qualified? Because you, you said that to yourself. And, and I think that I mean, here you are now, the job that you had could not, did not believe you would at all get is the, the only one that gave you an offer. How crazy is yeah. that? So let me give you these bullet points. So that's, that's my story, but let me give you these bullet points. So how to fit a resume of freelance, how to translate that to corporate, keep track of your numbers, keep track of every single number. And I'm not just talking about follower growth, definitely keep track of that, but keep track of your impressions, keep track of how much content you've managed, how many pieces of content you made, how many pieces of content you edited. I mean, keep track of literally every single number because that is the, the data that shows you that's something I can put on a chart and I can show you I'm capable of growth. Um, write a better story. So on your resume, the words that you choose, we all know this to be true. The words that you choose to describe what you did translates to what you're going to do. So essentially, whenever a job is posted, there's all these keywords. And so you want to look through that and say, okay, this is a keyword that describes what I did. So pull that keyword and use that in, in your resume to describe what you did better. Like, honestly, like your choice of words and how you say what you did it can mean whether you get the interview or not simply because it matches a keyword because in our brains when you're because I've interviewed people and when you're interviewing somebody you just draw connections between that job description you wrote and what you're seeing in front of you because you are interviewing a bunch of people or you're trying to find a quick match or maybe you're under a lot of pressure or you just got to the end of the day and you're decision fatigued and so you're just drawing connections between what you see here and here so go and look through that job description that, that you you want and find key words in there that better describe on your resume what's happening, pull those keywords over. So write a better story, keep track of your numbers, and 100% walk in as I'm a business owner, not I'm a freelancer. So drop the word freelancer uh, and change it to I'm a business owner. I've been running my business X amount of years. I have X amount of clients, and this is what I have done for my clients this is how I've scaled my business. And when they ask why you want to get out, it's super simple. You don't like you're, you're done with the stress of running a business. Running a successful business is stressful. It's pretty easy to like translate that over. And honestly, it's a really well accepted answer. That's actually, I think probably a hard one for people to talk about. So I, those three steps are perfect. So we're, we're, putting more numbers and telling a better story. Um, we are we're changing from freelancer to business owner. And then I love that, that, um, that phrase there. Cause I feel like that's the question you get asked a lot. Why are you switching? Well, running a successful business is really stressful and I'm looking for something more consistent. Yeah. Beautiful. Super easy. Okay. Amazing. So you got the job at Walmart. Amazing. So you started there as a creative strategist and you've had three different titles in three years. So you've also been growing a lot there. So what tips do you have for growing in a corporate role? Surround yourself with the right people. Um, a good boss is, uh, worth more to you than a higher paycheck. Uh, that's, 
I mean, for real, surround yourself with the right people. Having a boss who is invested in your growth and invested in helping you get credit for your work is so important in a corporate world. Because when you when you're in a corporate world, you're like in this giant wave pool and there's always something coming. You're always, you know, you're always busy and there's a lot of people in the wave pool and you need somebody who is a leader who's going to basically, you know, like when you're a kid in a wave pool with your dad and your dad like picks you up, like over all the people and puts you on his shoulders or like you're in the lake or you're somewhere, you know, you're basically need a leader who's going to do that. Who's going to put you on their shoulders and say, look at, look at this person that I'm leading, look at what they've accomplished, look at where they are. And that's what you need. Surround yourself. I have had extremely good leadership at Walmart. I've had extremely good coworkers. And uh, I think surrounding yourself with people who are invested in seeing you succeed and who are invested in your, uh, they're invested in your growth. I think that's honestly all of it. I know that but I could give you like a, a billion more tiny little detailed type things, but the crux of it all is yes, having good leadership. So if you find yourself in a position where you're like, I don't have a good leader. If you're in a position where you're like, I have a leader who takes credit for my work. Um, I would say to find yourself a better leader as soon as you possibly can, because the truth is you're just going to be fighting against the wind. You're not going to be able to get ahead of a, of a leader of someone above you who is not uh, helping you succeed. So I, it yeah. sounds simplistic in advice like find a better leader but that would I would make that my number one goal if you're in a position where you're like I, I just I can't get anywhere my leadership uh, takes credit for my work or I just can't like find a better leader and that is like getting on a rocket to the moon as opposed to taking a Hyundai such a good analogy and so many guests have, have just mentioned in different ways how having an internal advocate at the company is just so, so valuable because they, again, they can, like, like you said, you can probably get there on your own, but it's going to take you so much longer. And so having someone that's there advocating for you, stepping up, if someone questions your value because of your age, someone who's there, that's going to, you know, show you different opportunities that they think would be good for you. I absolutely agree with you. And everyone says it too. People don't quit their jobs. They quit their boss. So finding oh, someone true. that you love to work for is, is absolutely important. And then I would also say there's two always that I would leave for people also trying to grow in corporate, always speak every meeting, always speak. I mean, don't, don't say something of no value or don't say something just to blow air, but like always find something of value to say, even if it's one sentence in every single meeting that you're in. Um, and then the other always is to always give props, uh, pointing out how your other team members are doing a great job or how they benefited you are always like giving people roses um, whenever they deserve it. That is a quick way to make allies. That's a quick way to be seen as a team player. And that's a quick way to just be respected more in your workplace and to also give respect. It's a give and take. So always speak in every meeting and always give props. Those are two more like bullet points I would say that definitely are a way in corporate to not just grow, but to create a network creating a network of people in corporate is extremely important. I love how actionable you're making this episode, Lindsay. This is so great. <laughs> okay. So we, you've been moving up. Now you are the senior marketing manager at Walmart. What does your current role entail? Um, so I kind of touched on it earlier, but I help manage our 4,700 stores, social media presence. So Walmart is uh, really unique. We we see ourselves, I think. Um, oh, sorry. Can we actually cut this part? I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. It, do, how much yeah. editing do you do? How much um, editing I, do you do? I don't do a lot, but if you want me to cut out a part, I can make a note. I can okay, cut this yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah, we need to cut out this part. I need to rephrase that, actually. Um, you want to just start at the top? I'll ask you what your role entails again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Let me just make a note at the timestamp for out right now. Sorry, I realize I'm like, I can't use the word we. I can't. I'm not allowed. <laughs> Good. Okay. Actually, I'm going to make like a. Okay, we'll go ahead and start. All right. So you're now the senior marketing manager at Walmart. What does your role entail? 
Um, so I manage our 4,700 stores social media presence. So all of our stores have a Facebook account and then we have some other uh, social media platforms that we're also on. Uh, if you want to, you can go look up your town and Walmart and follow your town's Facebook page. I highly recommend it. Our associates are extremely creative. They are um, bringing a lot of value to the community through these Facebook pages. So highly recommend that you go follow, give it a follow and get to know what's going on at your local Walmart. Uh, but yeah, so that's what I do. I manage uh, our tech side. I manage our, our content side. I talk with our social platforms and I uh, manage our campaign side as well for uh, those pages. That is insane. I didn't even know that that I can't, I guess you kind of maybe see that a little big chain like that might have local social media, but to like put that into a number of 4,500 social accounts, that's absolutely insane. So you mentioned earlier that that's called micro marketing. Can you explain a little bit more about what a micro marketing strategy is? Um, I think a better, you know, I think a better phrase that I should have said is localized marketing uh, or even community marketing. So instead of just looking at where this large brand, I think what benefits companies is when they start to think more like how do how do we build communities at a small level so i think building a community that you can market to is very similar to how influencers do it but i think that brands who have those uh, that have like a physical location can look at that physical location as that five to ten mile radius around it is their community just like an influencer would have a niche that is who they can market to super well. That's going to walk into their store. That's going to walk through their doors and buy something because it's convenient. It's close by and it matters to them. People care about what is close to them. That seems so simple, but it's just 100%. We care about what is closest to us in proximity because that is what most affects our lives. So whenever you think about community marketing, who can tell that story the best but the people who live and work in that area, which are the people who work in your store. So I think that's kind of an overview of how my job functions at Walmart. Of I help those associates um, to take what would be like a big campaign or a big idea that Walmart has and how can we partner with the store associate to make it make sense for that community. And so with that many stores, how many associates, that's a ton of social media accounts. How many associates do you work with? A, a lot, a lot. Um, I don't think I can give the exact number, but like I like in the hundreds, you. like I'm assuming, or more like thousands. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So yeah, our associates are super creative. Our associates are super um, in tune with what goes on in their store. So what they post is usually what's most relevant to their community. So they might post like something like, and like I said, I highly encourage you to go look at your local Facebook page. You'll probably see an associate posing with a product that's on rollback, or you'll probably see an associate posing with a new product they got in their store that maybe only their area has. Maybe it's a local product that was made in that area. So that's what you're going to see when you go to a, a, a local Facebook page for Walmart. Uh, and you'll see the creativity of the associates and them speaking directly to their community and the customers who walk through their doors. And I, I feel like your experience originally doing this for local businesses kind of all ties in now to what you do, right? Because that used to yes. be you going door to door doing that local yes. marketing. <laughs> yes. So that is, yeah. So that experience is a lot of how I did get my role is they actually I mean, my, my director who interviewed me turned out he really loved the fact that I had experience with small businesses, which was something that I never thought would matter to a large corporation. Turns out it mattered a lot. And so they liked my experience. And that was a big part of how I got the role, which is why you should apply for everything. Never assume anything about a company. <laughs> I think that we as consumers come up with these like personas or maybe these personalities for large corporations. And I would say never assume anything about a large corporation ever, never make assumptions. So always apply, always give it a shot because you never know what experience is lurking in your resume. That's going to matter a whole lot to that corporation. Incredible. Okay. Well, we are going to wrap this up with a couple rapid fire questions I have for you. So we'll start off. What is your favorite marketing book, podcast, or news source that you'd recommend? 
Mm, this is a trick question. Am I supposed to say Sky Society? <laughs> yes, yes. Or else your or else this episode's never going live. <laughs> um I I would say for inter okay, so to learn more about marketing, like as a as an entity or to for yourself for like personal growth. Um, maybe you got one for each or, or what are you just like a podcast you'd recommend, like to someone who's listening or a book you'd recommend or, or something or a blog to someone who's listening to the episode. Okay. I think for personal growth, I would 100%. I had like two books actually I would recommend. I would recommend, um, it's a book called the creative curve. Um, it came out a few years ago. I actually had the opportunity to meet the author. Uh, so the creative curve, it's a, it, it talks a lot about how things work in popularity. So if you're working in marketing, um, this would actually, I would recommend for to learn more about marketing. If you're working in marketing, the concept of the creative curve, um, can help you when you're planning content, when you're planning uh, a campaign or a strategy, it helps you kind of understand how do things historically work in popularity so that you can kind of hit this sweet spot with your strategy and your content. It's really going to hit the timing that you're at on that creative curve in this moment in time. R highly recommend the book for learning more about marketing. Um, for personal growth, uh, definitely You Are a Badass at Making Money by Jen Sincero. You've probably heard about it. It's I've read it. Out. It's a great it years book. Ago. I've read it like five times because every time <laughs> I read it, I learn something new. That was one of the books that definitely helped me stop seeing myself. It's just, please, like, please give me something. And started. I started seeing myself as I am a business owner. I own my knowledge. I own my confidence. And I will say in, in You Are a Badass at Making Money, she talks a lot about writing down how much money you want to make and putting it somewhere and, and thinking about that number a lot. And I know people, I have my own qualms with manifestation theory, but I will say that is something that I have always done and I've always kept a number. And then whenever I've um, gone to the table for anything, I've kept that number firmly in my mind. I'm like, I'm not going to betray myself. And I will say it has worked every time. I don't know what it is, but, um, I've had like specific numbers in my mind of like, man, that's what, that's what I want to make. That is it. And then it might be six months later, it might be a few weeks later, but I've gotten calls. It was like, Hey, this is how much you're going to make for this. And so I, firmly believe that having a number somewhere be like, this is my goal. This is what I want. I firmly believe that that is a very successful way to build that confidence in yourself. I agree. Such a great book. And, and I think especially for women and money too, because, um, you know, with the wage gap, I think it's really, really important to keep fighting for your worth. And I encourage all of the girls that go through our accelerator to do that too. So such a good book. I totally, I haven't read it in a while. So now that you've said that, I'm gonna have to go back and reread that. Okay. What is the biggest trend in your industry right now? Oh, this is, there's an answer. I think people want to hear about marketing. And then there's an answer that I think is the actual trend. So Ooh, all what, right, all right. <laughs> yeah, I think what people want to hear about marketing is they want to hear about metaverse. They want to hear about AI. They want you know they want to hear about virtual realities. That's that's what everybody wants to hear about because it's the hot shit right now. I think what is actually a trend is that people are starving for authenticity. We are starving for a real experience. And so while we're being told by all the tech giants and we're being told by all the one percenters of like the future is this virtual reality, the future is fake is basically what we're being told. I think the real trend is that people are starving for something real and we want some sort of real experience, whether that is on social media uh, with a product or it's, on, or it's a real experience in a store, people, want to experience something that will actually matter in their lives. So I think things like product reviews, um, super honest and quick tutorials, educational pieces, I think that is kind of the future of content. And while everyone is investing a whole lot of money into something that is fake or it's a faux reality, 
I think we're going to actually see people moving more and more towards they, they want to experience real. It's an unpopular opinion, but it's mine. I agree with it. And the, I'm not going to go too much into it because we were coming. We're, yeah, we've already, we talked a lot today. Ooh, I just lost AirPod. Uh, but one of the trends that I've been talking or seeing a lot about is how search is happening more on TikTok than it's happening on Google. And I think a big reason for that is because the content on TikTok seems so much more authentic than the content that you see on Instagram, where it's like some big corporation who like wrote this post to optimize for SEO instead of writing maybe what someone would actually write if they authentically wrote about the product or the, the topic. So that's kind of one of the things that we've been seeing a lot too. Always ask yourself when you're looking at a trend is, am I being asked to buy into this? Because think about how much money is being pumped into virtual realities. Um, am I being asked to buy into something? I, I think then you can kind of start to see like a trend of how people who build the things are trying to say, this is the future because they want you to invest a lot in it, but that doesn't necessarily mean they speak for the masses. That doesn't necessarily mean that it is the future. Amazing. Okay. My last one for you is what's your biggest tip for being a better employee? I know, I know we're over time. So I'm like, how can I make this so quick? <laughs> biggest tip for being a better employee. Actually, I got, you know what, actually, I got this piece of advice from my director. He gave me this piece of advice years ago and it was epic be the last to speak. So you're on a meeting, you guys are coming up with something, really take in the room, take in everybody's opinions, take in everybody's ideas, make sure you're really listening to them, and then be the last to speak. Um, it's a more powerful statement. It means you're incorporating everybody's thoughts and ideas, you're giving them that respect and that space. And then you're actually coming up with a better idea probably by the end because you're pulling in all of this that you're observing to come up with a better conclusion. So I said earlier, always speak in meetings, but then I would also follow that up with be the last to speak. I think that's a perfect way to wrap it up. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for coming on the podcast. Um, I feel like we talked about so many important topics today that I'm even super passionate about. So this was so much fun. Where can our audience find you if they want to learn more about you? Uh, LinkedIn, uh, Lindsay Park, Park with an E at the end. And uh, you can also find me on Instagram. My username is Sunlens, S-U-N-L-I-N-D-S. And I'm also on TikTok and same username. I guess you could find me on Twitter, but I'd rather you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> that's where we're going also first. Same, <laughs> yeah, also same username, but yeah, that's where you can find me. Well, thank you again for coming on the Sky Society podcast. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Natalie, so much for having me.